The title of our study is The True Circumcision. This is part two with Philippians chapter number three. Let's look at verse one. Now, I'm going to read some verses. We did cover verse one and two last uh, week. But as I was thinking about it on the way home, I mean, I could, I could be still saying these verses for, for a while. As I was thinking about it, um, there's some other things I want you to see in these verses before we move on to verse 3. So let's read verse 1 and 2 and then have a word of prayer. Thank you, Father. Paul says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you. To me, indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, your holy word. We thank you for your holy son, the Lord Jesus, which gives us access to your word. For he is the living word of God, Father. It is through his shed blood on Calvary's cross that we have a relationship with you by faith alone, in Christ's shed blood alone. We thank you for the holy scriptures that we can study each and every day and come together a couple times a week with those of my precious faith and share in, in the fellowship of mystery and the rightly divided word. Please feed us tonight, Father, your holy truth. That's what our heart's desire is, and we know that you will, for it is your will. So we thank you for it in Christ's name. Amen. Look at the first uh, word of verse 1. Paul says, finally. I didn't do this last time, but I, I, I was thinking about when Paul used that word finally, that means something. He's coming to the end, particularly of a process. That's what finally means. We're at the end of a process. And so I decided, I said, you know, let me look at the times that the Apostle Paul uses this ter term finally. Well, here in Philippians chapter number 3, verse 1, notice what he says here. He's coming to a conclusion here in chapters 3 and 4 of the book. He says, finally, my brethren, the last thing he wants us to, to know as he writes to these faithful saints, the Philippians, was this. Rejoice in the Lord. And re remember what that issue of rejoice is to constantly joy, to joy again. It is to show that you are very happy and have great delight. And the one that we are to have that great delight is the Lord. Now notice he didn't say Jesus. He didn't say Christ. When he, when he calls the Lord Jesus Christ the Lord, he's focusing on that issue of him being the righteous judge, the one who's going to be at the judgment seat of Christ. It is that that we look forward to. And we went over all that last week. If, you, if you're listening to this on the internet, uh, by the time you see this, we would have last week's up as well. So make sure you look at that. That issue of the Lord is the righteous judge. Paul is looking forward in this book to the judgment seat of Christ. And we should too. Now most saints can't say they're looking forward to it. If, if you're not studying the rightly divided word, understanding the mystery given to Paul, what we saw last time is, for uh, go over to Romans chapter number 13. Go over to Romans 13. If you want to see in, in a verse what the judgment seat of Christ is about, uh, it's Romans chapter 13. You can see in Romans 13, in this passage, exactly what the judgment seat of Christ is all about. God allows us to see from our human viewpoint that which is going to happen in, in the heavenly places. Notice here, Romans chapter 13. Now, this is civil authorities, okay? He says in verse 3, For rulers are not a terror. Now, that word terror is the same word Paul uses in 2 Corinthians 5, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. We persuade men. If you're not walking in the good works of God's grace, there should be this terror upon you. You to work out your own salvation in fear and trembling. Well, if you're walking in the good works, notice what it says. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the what? Evil. Paul's going to talk about evil workers over in Philippians 3. Verse number 3 here in Romans 13. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? That's the power, the authority of that judge or, or, or the, the, the ruler. Do that which is what? good. If you're walking in the good works of God's grace that Paul lays out in his epistles, you don't have to be afraid. You are looking forward to it. Okay? Notice it says, do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. That word praise, Paul uses in 1 Corinthians 4 when he talks about the judgment seat of Christ. Then shall every man have praise of God. That's what we're to look for. And if, you're, if you love the appearing, I spent an hour and a half at Sunday's Q&A with that young man, Stephen, just he and I. And he was asking me every question. They were great questions. Hopefully Ryan will put that on in there for those because he has a great question. He says, what is that reward? And we went through verse after verse. It is the reigning with the Lord Jesus Christ, that crown of righteousness. 
You're only going to get that crown if you're faithful in the mystery. That's, that's the simplest way, and we went over that. Well, here, you're going to get that praise of the Lord. You're going to share in that joint inheritance, that crown of rejoicing, that crown of righteousness, if you're faithful to the mystery. Okay? So go back to uh, Philippians chapter number 3. When Paul talks about rejoice in the Lord, we as grace believers, if you love the appearing, 2 Timothy 4, if you love the mystery, and just look look around. There's not a lot of people who love the mystery. Therefore, it's not going to be a lot of people who get that crown of righteousness to reign with Christ. Paul says, if we suffer, with, suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us, 2 Timothy 2, 12. He will deny you that reign. And the, where he's going to do it, let me put my cowboy hat back up here, like Jim calls it. It's really a throne. It's a, it's a judgment seat of Christ. He said it like a cowboy hat. All right. This is the, the judgment seat of Christ. And, and I, I mentioned, and every every time I get in the pulpit, I mention that because that's what Paul, that's what Paul, was, look, look at that verse again. Chapter 3, verse 1. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in who? The Lord. And when he says Lord, he's talking about the righteous judge. Understand that by working out your own salvation with fear and trembling, you can look forward to that. Paul did. Philippians 3 is my favorite passage of Scripture because it, it's, it's, it's the prize. We're going to see it's the prize of the high calling of God in Christ. That's what that is. Okay? So we can rejoice in that like the Philippians because we're following Paul as he follows the Lord. Now, look at that, that issue of Verse 1, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. Now, now, watch what Paul says. To write the same things to you, he's constantly reminding them this. To me, indeed, it's not grievous. I, I said when you have a child or children, you've got to constantly remind them things. And, and it, gets, it, gets, it, it gets tedious or grievous to constantly remind them, right? But they're children. Paul, because they're his spiritual children, it did not... It did not get grievous for him. It wasn't tedious for him to constantly remind him. Why? Look at the rest of the verse. But for you, it is safe. I mentioned last week, we tell Jada Lynn, you cannot, anytime you're in a parking lot or, or any street, you have to hold a grown-up's hand. We constantly remind her to the point where she says, I know, I know. But we want to remind her because it is safe. We want to drill that. Well, that's what Paul is saying. He wants you to remind her that, listen, everything we do, we're looking forward to the judgment seat of Christ. Now, there are other times Paul uses the term finally. Let's look at them. Go with me, if you will, to 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Go back a few books to 2 Corinthians 13. As Paul ends the book of 2 Corinthians in chapter number 13, look what he says in verse 11. Another finally. Another finally. We're going to look at the finalists. That's right, Dorothy. I didn't do this last week, but I was thinking, you know what? It would be interesting to look at all the times that Paul used that issue of finally. By the way, it's mentioned six times in Scripture. And all in the so-called New Testament, so from Matthew through Revelation. But what's interesting, of those six times, five of the times are in Paul's epistles. So it's a huge thing that's finally. We're coming to the end of a process. The only other time it's used is 1 Peter 3.8. We might look at that later. But let me show you. Look what it says in 2 Corinthians 13, verse 11. As Paul constantly reminds them about his apostleship and his authority, he says, finally, brethren, what does he say? Farewell. Now let me tell you something. When you know the book of 2 Corinthians and 1 Corinthians, and he wrote before another epistle to them, it's almost as Paul says, whew, I am, I am done having to rebuke these people. He's like, farewell. He is... He is 13 chapters he's just getting and then that's just the 2 Corinthians then the 16 chapters of 1 Corinthians and then however long that first epistle he wrote there wasn't scripture but it was, it, was, it was an epistle reproving them and correcting them as well he's like finally brethren farewell by the way look at that word farewell it's not just saying alright see you later farewell he's, he's, he's giving them a blessing he's saying if you listen to me you will farewell you, you, you're going to have welfare you're going well, to farewell then look what he says here Verse 11, be perfect. Now let me ask you, is Paul asking a bunch of sinners saved by God's grace who still have these, these sinful bodies, is he telling them to be sinful, per, sinless perfection? No. What, what do we know about perfect? Spiritually mature, right? He's calling them to be uh, 
Truly furnished unto all good works. And that happens through the Word of God. And it's going to be through the Word of God's grace, the mystery, that they will be perfect. He's commanding them, be perfect. Verse 11. Be of what? Good comfort. Again, after having to reprove them, one of the things when you deal with your children, you guys know this, you have to, you have to punish them or, or deal with them, reprove them and so forth. But then after that, you want to comfort them. If I have to, if I have to reprove, prove or discipline Jada Lynn, after a time, she always needs to come and give me a hug and feel like I love her. I have to reconfirm my love to her. I have to comfort her. That's what it is. Paul says that's what the Word of God would do if they listen to him. Okay, give them strength. Be of one mind. Obviously, that one mind is the mind of Christ, given through the Apostle Paul's doctrine. Live in what? Peace. Yeah. All these things, there's joy and peace in believing the Word of God. Now, when you do those things, when you put effort, when you make by the choice of your will as saints to do that, look at verse 11. And the God of what? Love and peace shall be with you. God's love, His peace, that peace that passed all understanding, will be what's operating amongst the saints. Interesting, that's the way He ends the epistles to the Corinthians. That's a wonderful way of, 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 of look at verse 12. Always got to get this one. Because a brother in the Lord, <laughs> Kristen, no, when we uh, began Twin Cities Grace Fellowship years ago, this one brother, we had to kick him out. He was, he was an elderly man in his late 70s. And he would drive the ladies away because he would be a little too, uh, what I say, friendly. And uh, we dealt with long-suffering ladies who call him, Brother Ron, I don't want to come back. You got to keep trying to kiss me and grope me, this, that, and the other. And when we and his brother sat down with him, he, he quoted this verse. He says, right there, he says, greet one another with the holy kiss. So I would greet everybody. I go, you don't do it to the men. <laughs> he would try to kiss all the ladies and use that as very, I go, you never kissed me like that, Bob, you know. Anyway, that's not what that is. You know how they do over the Mediterranean, they, they kiss each other on the cheek like Italians do. Okay. Uh, if I was a holy kiss, okay, that was one that represents holiness amongst the saints, okay? Oh, yeah. Wow, yeah. He lived He lived in the same city, Bloomington, where Chris and I did. Anyway, we'd see him at the cup food store every once in a while. i say, how you doing, Bob? I don't think he ever repented of that stuff. Anyway, that's, that's not what Paul is saying, go around kissing all the ladies. He said, <laughs> that, how, we, how we give each other a hug or a handshake here in our culture, that, that cultural thing, that's what it was. And that's how the saints, it, it showed the love of the saints, okay? All right. So let's go back to, uh, what do you, so we're looking at the final least. Go to Ephesians chapter number 6. Go to Ephesians chapter number 6. Let's look at no, <laughs> this issue of finally. It's interesting to look at when Paul says finally. We've come into the end of the process. We saw with the Corinthians, it was live in love, live in peace. Farewell. I'm, I'm, I'm done rebuking. I'm, you know, it was hard for Paul to do that. Look what he says to the Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, my brethren. And now what we what did we learn about brother? He said, finally, my brethren. Over there, the Corinthians, he said it, and so forth. In Philippians, what does brother? Remember, what, what do we say? Brothers mean like Cain and Abel. Am I my brother's keeper? Is the one who has your back, who who is helping you, a helper, a brother, someone who's who you in the same family. We're in the family of God, and we help one another. Finally, my brethren. Now notice. Oh, this is be strong. Where in the Lord? What does that mean? Well, that means. When you're, when you're understanding who the Lord Jesus Christ and you have that fear and trembling, understanding the terror of the Lord, knowing that He desires for us to operate in these good works, you will be strong. Notice it says, and in the power of His might. That's the working of His Spirit, the Spirit of Christ. That issue of suffering with Him in the doctrine, knowing that you're going to get glorified, that's what Paul says. Uh, let me show you something. Go over, to, go over to Philippians chapter 1. As Paul was, was in prison... Look at verse number 19, Philippians 1, 19. How's Paul, what did, what did the Lord say? When Paul had that thorn in the flesh, he asked the Lord twice. The Lord says, he said unto me, my what is sufficient for you? My grace, grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. To be strong in the power of his might is to be strong in his grace. Understanding the doctrine of Christ. Now notice what Paul says here, verse 19. 
Philippians 1. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation. He's not talking about his soul salvation. Saved from despair of, 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 his, of his circumstance there in, 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 Rome, in prison. Through your prayer. So there's that laboring together in prayer. There's a spiritual labor there. It's, it's a, that's a labor of love. There's power there. And the supply. Now notice the supply of the what? Spirit of Jesus Christ. He didn't just say the Holy Spirit. He did not say the Spirit of God. He said the Spirit of Jesus Christ. That has to do with that suffer, understanding that there's suffering with Him, but there's glory. We can endure knowing that the things, the trials we go through today for the mystery, there's glory. The Spirit of Jesus Christ. It's like when He says, the Spirit itself beareth witness that we are the Spirit of God. Then He says, He says, Jesus Christ maketh intercession for us over there in Romans 8. How does the Lord, let me, let me show you what I'm talking about. Go over Romans 8. That's, that supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, that's Romans 8, 9, and, and Romans 8, verse, uh, let me see here. That's Romans 8, 9, and Romans 8, 34. Look at Romans 8, 9. Romans 8, 9. But ye are not in the flesh, okay, but in the Spirit. If so, that, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, now watch how Paul describes this. Now if any man have not the Spirit of what? Christ. He is none of his. The way the Spirit of God dwells in you, when you allow that Spirit of Christ, that mind of Christ, that's the doctrine of the Apostle Paul, the Word of Christ to dwell in you. And it was that understanding that allowed Paul the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. It strengthened him. That's another way of saying it over here. Look at, look at Romans chapter 8, verse 34. Remember what Christ stands for. In these last days of grace, when Paul talks about Christ, it's the one who suffers, understanding that there's glory. That's what Romans 8, 17 is all about. He says, joint heirs with Christ. He didn't say joint heirs with Jesus. He didn't say joint heirs with the Lord. He said joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we might be what? Glorified together. Christ has to do with suffering and glory. And not every believer suffers for the mystery. That's why every believer is not going to be a joint heir. You're not going to... You know why God the Father can't equally give you what Jesus Christ has? Because Jesus suffered and he was glorified. Philippians 2. Go look at those studies. When you suffer with him, You'll be glorified together when he's coronated king of the heavens. He's going to do that. Those who love, they're going to get that crown of righteousness. Not every believer is going to, it's not really that hard, but Where people make it glory. Say, excuse me? Where did you find glory? Glorified. Yes, I will. Go with me. Uh, best way to show. She, she, the question for those of us, will I define glory? Uh, go back to Romans 5. Get, get two passages. Romans 5, and then we'll look at 2 Timothy 2. Dorothy says, "What well, I define glory? Glory. If somebody would suffer with him, that we might be now. Watch this. Glorified together with him. Okay. Together with Christ. Well, what did the Lord Jesus Christ earn? In Philippians chapter number two, we're going to see that in a minute. But look at Romans chapter five. Watch what God is doing with us. Great question, Dorothy. Verse one." Therefore, being justified by faith. So here's our initial justification or salvation. You're justified how? By faith. No works. Where's your current standing as a believer? We have what? Peace with God how? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. So everybody understands that's your position. You're justified by faith. Position. You're justified by faith and you have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's do the faith of Christ. There's your position. But that's not all God. God's will is that all men be saved and come into the law of the truth. Every dispensation should know that. The twofold will of God. So there's your practice now. Your practice is by faith too. By, by you trusting the faith of Christ. That's where your works, the good works and so forth. Look at this. Verse number two. Okay. By whom also. So this is an addition to what your justification, your position. By whom also, by the Lord Jesus Christ, we have, what's that next word? Access. We have access. Paul didn't say we have it. He says we have access. You, it's made available. It's it's here for you. Now come get it. 
But how do you access it? How? What's the next two words? By faith, right? Everybody with me? Romans 5, verse 2? I don't want to just think, y'all think I'm just making it. There it is, right? Access. If someone puts a million dollars in a bank account, before you can just go down to the bank and get it, you have to access it by an account number, some ID, all these things that they set up for the protection of that money that the rightful person get it. So you have to access it. The way you access what we're going to see, Dorothy, the glory of God is by faith. That's the second by faith. That's, that's your walk. That's your practice. We find glory. That's what, what we're about to do. What is glory? It's right here. <laughs> Keep going. I, I, I got I to expound on it. I got to teach it okay. so that you can see it, it's... No, because I'm, I'm just thinking, I'm, I'm about to define it, but I want you to see there's a process there. It, it's just not something that just comes naturally. Look is at that. Position? Yes, that's what it is. But but keep keep going. We have access by faith into this grace where we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of who? God. What is glory, Dorothy? It's sharing the life and the power of Almighty God. Of God Himself, He's going to share that. That's glory. Yes. What's more, what's more glorious than God? And the reason I had to show you the entire verse, if I just said glory is God is, you, God is going to give you the same exact position that He Himself has. That's what He's going to do. What, what's the term Most High God? What does the Most High God mean from Genesis chapter fourteen? Everybody, anybody know? Yeah. What does it mean? The, the only one. The, <coughs> look it up yourself. The possessor of heaven and earth. Okay. Okay? Satan himself wants to, he says, I will be like the most high. What he wants to do, he wants to possess heaven and earth. So in short, Dorothy, the glory of God has to do with who possesses, who owns, who runs who rules, who reigns over heaven and earth. The Lord Jesus Christ has earned it. The Lord Jesus Christ, Philippians 2. But he is willing, Dorothy, to shift. By the way, that's what the glory is, to possess the heaven and the earth, right? That's the glory. So that's the short answer, that's the glory. When he says we rejoice in hope of the glory of God, God is willing to share that with us. Yeah, because who got it? Jesus Christ our Lord. He says, if you suffer with me, you'll be glorified together. When, when, God, when God the Father coronates God the Son as King of Heaven, I'm going to show you. Remember, you said, I'm going to show you something. He's going to take those of us who suffered with Him in the mystery. He's going to also glorify us together with Him. He's, the same coronation Christ has, we're going to have. I'm going to show you that. That's grace. That's grace, right. It's grace. Here, watch this. But see, you ha you still have to be worthy. When we talk about grace... That's working out your salvation. That, bam, say that again. That's working out your salvation. Everybody thinks just... Okay, here's grace. I, I'm a, the Bible definition of grace is this. I know people say, unmarried, favor, undeserved time. That's true, but it's more than that. Yes, it is. It is freedom, or liberty, freedom, with responsibility and consequences. Listen, God dealt with Adam on the basis of grace, but he said, son, I love you, but you cannot eat of that tree. You can eat freely of all the trees in the garden. God dealt with Adam on the basis of grace from the start. He said, son, I love you. You can eat freely of all the trees, but I'm going to test you out to see how much you love me. Of that one tree, you can eat of all the trees, but that one tree which is in the midst of God, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, don't, it, it, you don't eat of it. For in the day that thou eat of it, thou shalt what? Surely yeah. die. What was his responsibility? Not to eat of the tree. What was the consequence? Death. Sin. Yeah. The world. Right. So even from the beginning, grace is always freedom with responsibility and, and accountability or consequences. And that's the same today. For we are his workmanship. Before we look at uh, 1, 1 Timothy 6, go to Ephesians chapter number 2. 
it amazes me that Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 amongst dispensations is such a famous passage. Nobody quotes verse 10. Nobody. Or hardly anybody. God's will is that all men be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth. Position practice. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Ephesians 2, 10. Watch this. Look, look at this. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace, everybody see the grace. For by grace are ye saved through what? Faith. That's through the faith of Christ, your, your faith in Him. <clears throat> that not of yourselves, it's no works of own. It is the gift of God. That's salvation. It's the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. For, remember what that word for stands for. Further explanation of what I just said. I'm going to amplify what I just said. It's the same thought of chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. This one is our position. Here's our practice. What do we do after we're saved? For we, that's the body, are His workmanship, right? The Lord, the Father's. Created where? Notice what He calls them. In Christ Jesus, the issue of suffering and glory. We are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto what? Good works. Which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. The free gift of salvation comes with responsibility. Work out your own salvation, right? Work it out. It's free, but there's some good works that we should walk in them. Now, here's the question. What if a believer chooses not to walk in those good works? There's Yay. Consequences. There's consequences, and that consequence is you lose out on the reward of the inheritance. Well, there's also other consequences. Well, but th th these are temporal, Dorothy. That's what that's right. that's what saying. Don't he wants you to focus on here? Now forget that. Rejoice in the Lord. The, the righteous judge is coming. Paul's going to say, "Let your moderation be known to, unto all men. The Lord is at hand." Look, look at that. Look at that. Uh, go to Philippians chapter number four. I see all of this stuff, and, and my frustration: it's not being taught. Yes. It's not being taught. You know, I know. I got just to say this comment me all, all the time. But Ron, it's not being taught. Look at chapter 4 of Philippians, verse 4 and 5. What, what does this mean? I mean, I think when people read the Bible, can I just say, I think when they read it, they really don't believe what they're reading. Just, oh, I got my reading man for the day. <laughs> just leisurely. For real. <clears throat> because when I read it, I go... Every word means something. Okay, look at Philippians 4, verse 4 and 5. Rejoice in the Lord. By the way, that's how he started verse, chapter 3, verse 1. Rejoice in the Lord. So he's going to remind him. Rejoice in the Lord always. In every way, that word always. And again, I say what? Rejoice. Y'all see me up here. If the Apostle Paul was up here, he'd be frantic like this. Y'all understand? Y'all understand what's going on right there? Because this is what he's saying in the, in the verse. Rejoice in the Lord. Joy again, constantly. And again, by the way, if you didn't get it, I say what? Rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. That issue of moderation, that has to do with you governing your life based upon the fact that the judgment of Christ is right there. How do we know? Let your moderation be known unto all men. Why? The Lord is what? What does that mean? He's, he's right there about to come at any moment. Everybody get that? When something's at hand, it's within reach. There's my water right there. I don't have to tell my, my wife, hey, Chris, can you come up and get me that water? She'll do it, by the way. But why would I tell her to do that? Because it's at hand, I just do like this. Bam. So the, there's, the, there's the judgment seat of Christ. That's what he meant. The Lord is at hand. Rejoice in that. Rejoice in that. It's there. It's there. It's there. That's Paul's constant refrain. And so my frustration, when people are reading Philippians, what would he? What do they think he's saying there? They don't know. We've asked brothers who are dispensational preachers about these verses, and they don't know. And that's my frustration in these last days. Every saint should know these truths, and that's why my heart is you sad. You need to be preaching to the pastors. <clears throat> they don't want it, do I? I know. And I got, I got, I got, and it's on my heart now because I got... I got a, another assurity of that very thing today with a brother in the Lord who's a minister 
who rejects these things. And and his reason is is, is, is whack. He doesn't know it's it, and he doesn't want to know. And that's the worst part. He doesn't want to know. Yeah. That was gonna say it's it's pride. That, yeah, exactly. I, I even I even I even am willing to go to the brother and his entire congregation and have them question me on all these things. They're like, I, I, do. I do it with all of them. I, I offer that to the great of life. The point is, yeah, we're in the last days, y'all, it, and it's frustrating because I can see all these things and, and guys are not sharing it like they should. Yeah. Looking for... T- t- You're t- sharing it with us and it's not going as far as it would with the ministers. Right. Because they've got the congregations. To that's do. right, and that's my frustration. I'm not. I'm not frustrated at any of the saints. They're just. I'm frustrated at brothers like myself who are behind pulpits, right. so-called grace pulpits, grace right. ministers, who aren't teaching these things. Right. Look at First Timothy six. Dor- Dorothy would ask about defined glory. The glory of God is what it is. I've always heard it, but I just never had it explained. Well, 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 <coughs> so it's fullness. Right. And, 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 it, and it takes it takes time because there's a lot there. Go back, hold your hand there, First Timothy 6. Go to Philippians 2 again. See, Dorothy, when, when it says joint heirs with Christ. I want the meat of it. Yeah, I know you do, and that's why we're gonna that's why that's why you're here. The reason why people come and go is because they don't want the meat. That is your joint heir. When you're joint, that's equal. Uh when, when a husband and wife buys a home, they become joint tenants. In other words, they own it equally, 100% equal. Not even 50-50. Uh, uh, everybody get this. 100% equally. Equal. Krista couldn't kick me out. I couldn't kick her out. We we both have to agree to sell that thing. She couldn't just say, ah, I don't like my husband. I'm going to sell the house. The law will be like, you can't do that. That guy's joint tenant. He, he's, he, that's his house too, 100%. We'd have to come to an agreement as adults and say, here's what we do. You know what people do? They say, we're going to sell it and we're going to split the thing. 50-50. Joint is equal. Equal. Everything that's his is ours. That's awesome. Yes, that's, that's, that's God's that's grace. That's what you're saying. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> but wait a minute. It's more than that, Dorothy. Verse, chapter 2, verse 5. Of <laughs> chapter 2, verse 5. I'm sitting here talking with about Matt with this stuff. And they go, he said, he said, he said people are going to think we're nuts. What we said, I said, I know, man. We're just unpacking this stuff. We just, it's just popping off the page. And the reason I, it was, that's what needs to be left. The reason I would, I would read a verse and then have you guys, because I want to make sure you guys are sitting and I'm just not, it's there. Look, look at verse 5, Philippians 2, verse 5. Let this mind, so let means to allow, this is a, a choice. Let this mind be in you. Who is Paul talking to? Saints, right? Which was also in who? Christ, Christ Jesus. Jesus, okay? So there's his humanity. That's, How? that's joint. Well, you're about to see what the joint is. <laughs> if, if you let it. Okay, so who are we talking about? Christ Jesus. He called him Christ Jesus. He's the one who suffered knowing there's glory coming, and this is in his humanity. How did Jesus Christ walk when he was on earth? He had something in mind. Over in Hebrews says, he endured the cross, despising the shame, for the glory set before him. Krista, write that down. I want to, we're going to see that one. Hebrews, for the glory set before him. Because I'm going to show you guys what he was looking at and how we're going to look at it. Okay? Let's look at this. Who been in, all right, all right, so Dorothy, I'm, uh, just here it is in the verse. I'm with you. Who been in the form of God. So Jesus Christ could do something that we can't do. None of us is in the form of God. He was the word. He thought it not robbery to be what? Equal with God. 100%. <laughs> you know that term equal with God is only mentioned twice. And God God, God the Father says, let me check my, my, my sons and daughters are students. When God mentions a term twice in scripture, he wants you to look at it. The term equal with God is mentioned over in the book of John. Equal with God. When the Lord Jesus Christ told those Pharisees, I am the Son of God, they wanted to stone him by saying he was the Son, S-O-N, of God. He was making himself what? Equal, Equal with God. Yeah. Now watch this. Now how? what is God? The, the, the Most High, that's God. It is the possessor of heaven and earth. 
when he would tell people, my kingdom is not of this world and so forth, they would like, what's this guy talking about? He said, I own all of this. Yeah. Brother Matt did a great job. The Mount of Transfiguration, it's Mount Hermon over in Palestine, uh, 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 in Lebanon today, Syria, where the angels came down in Genesis 6 and, 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 and took worship and took wives and made these giants and so forth in Genesis 6. Go back, go back. We're doing this. That was the Mount of Transfiguration over there in Matthew. Where, where, where the Lord Jesus was transfigured his glory and who came down? Moses and Elijah, right? Representing the law and the prophets. And Peter says, Lord, it's good that we should be here. We should make three tabernacles. What they were doing was, the Lord was standing right where Satan's kingdom there was, was right there when the fallen angels came. And he says, I'm God. I, I own this. Mountains represent kingdoms. What I'm saying is, the Lord Jesus Christ has earned heaven and earth. And he has chosen to share that with us, particularly the heavenly places. He's going to share the earth with the faithful remnant of Israel. But he's going to share the heavens with the faithful remnant of the body, the possessing of it, the reigning. Okay, now look at this. So he does all this. Verse number 8, Philippians 2 8. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became, what's that next word? So is obedience part of the, of the process? Yes. Is every saint in the body obedient to the mystery? No. No. Obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now what did God do? All right, so here it is, Dorothy. Here's the glory. You ready? Here we go. Wherefore God also, because of the sacrifice, sacrificial life of Christ, we're called to be living sacrifices, Romans 12. Obedience of Christ. Wherefore God, by the way, there's a verse in 2 Corinthians 10 that says, take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, right? When we do that, guess what's going to happen? We're in Philippians 2 9. Wherefore God also, so Christ did, the Lord Jesus did something, or Christ, because he was suffering. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him. So, so check this out. Dorothy, the glory is a high exaltation, okay? Now, what does Paul say in Philippians 3? He says, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God. Then he also called. First Thessalonians says, he called us into his kingdom and his glory. First Thessalonians. He just don't want us to be in his kingdom. He wants us to possess his kingdom. All right. God is highly exalted him. Paul's going to use the term in Philippians 3. This is why it's my favorite chapter of the Bible. He talks about the prize of the high calling of God. Well, that's what the Lord Jesus was pressing towards in his earthly ministry. Let's look at it. Wherefore, verse 9. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above what? Every name. There's the glory. The high exaltation. Uh, where's my high exaltation? He gave him a, 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 a name above. That at the name of Jesus, there's his humanity. This, this, he's going to do the same thing with Dorothy and, and Bernice. And Elf. He's going to do that for us if we remain faithful like the Lord. Look at this. That every knee shall bow of things in heaven and things... Okay. Things in heaven, things on earth, and things under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is what? Lord right. to, the, to the what? Lord. Glory... So what's the glory? The exaltation of the Lord Jesus Christ, Dorothy, and all those faithful members in him, in the heavenly places. That's the glory. Let's look at it. Go to 1 Timothy chapter number 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Sure. Yes. That's how God the Father is going to receive glory through the Lord Jesus and through us. The question for those listening, but Jesus said, to the glory of God the Father. Yes, he receives glory when he exalts the Lord Jesus and the joint heirs of Christ in the heavens, just like God receives glory in the earth when he coronates Jesus Christ as king of the earth along with the nation of Israel. Okay, God receives glory through other people. When he made Adam, he says, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. Adam was created to bear God's glory. We ended Sunday study with this. 
the glory of the moon actually is the outworking of the glory of the light of the sun. The moon gets glory from the sun, right? The moon, the moon doesn't have inherent glory of itself, but it reflects the glory of the sun. And that's what we're going to do. That's what we're to do. We all going to reflect God's, the Father's glory, as His sons and daughters. It's going to reflect through us. So, how does God get glory, uh, Benisa? It's through exalting His faithful sons and daughters, us, if we're faithful, it's like the Lord. Now, look at this. In verse twelve of Philippians two. Philippians. Yeah, Philippians two. You were in Timothy six. Um, since she brought it up, I'm gonna. Oh. Okay. We're going to go back to 1 Timothy. Okay. Because, I mean, it goes right to her question. Okay? Okay, so, so Benicia's question is, what does it mean to the glory of God the Father? God the Father, by exalting the Lord Jesus Christ, God the Father receives glory. By exalting the joint heirs of Christ in that day, God the Father receives glory. How do we know we're part of that? Look at verse number 12. That word, wherefore. Paul is saying, everything I just told you, here's the conclusion of it. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, obedience there, right? Not as in my presence only when I was there in Acts 16, don't fill up on but now much more in my absence, I'm not there with you, I'm in Rome. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. The Lord Jesus Christ worked out his salvation with fear and trembling. If we have that same mind, we're going to receive that same... That's what it means to be a joint heir with Christ. He was highly exalted, and we will too. Let's look at it. That means... That's why Paul says, Romans 8, we'd be glorified together. Now, the last one. Look at what I say. 1 Timothy chapter 6. This is not taught a lot. I, I've, been, I've been in the grace of now almost 20 years, and I, it's not taught. And, and, and it's for such a time as this that we're here. It's a shame there's such a small audience to hear this. <laughs> when the Lord Jesus Christ came, he had a little flock, and he was the best perfect preacher and perfect man and perfect everything. In these last days, Dorothy, perilous times, it's a bad situation for the body, man. Look at look at First Timothy chapter. What is it? First Timothy six. Yeah. Verse number fourteen. Paul is commanding Timothy these same things: that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, unto the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he's talking about at the second coming here, which in his what times? What is he going to do? He shall show who is the blessed. And only potentate. See that word potentate? All powerful. But notice how he describes what it means to be all powerful. He's going to rule over heaven and earth, and he's going to do it in this way. The king, capital K of who? Kings. Kings. And the Lord, capital L, of who? Lord. Alright? Who are these kings and who are these lords? Of Christ in, in the heavens and, and the nation of Israel on the earth. Who in his times? This hasn't happened yet. He's going to get coronated as king of the heavens, and every joint heir will with him. When God the Father says, Hey, come all of heaven, worship my son, worship his body, the heavenly places, everything, we're going to rule over that. And God the Father, as humanity just multiplies forever, it will. God created the heavenly places to put people out there. That's why people try to go to the moon and to the Mars. Why? Humanity wants to go out there. God says, just wait a minute. I'm going to put you out there. i got to put my, my government out there first. That's what we're... So, so, so you're, Dorothy, you're going to... You stay faithful to your death or the rapture. You're going to rule over a piece of the heavenly kingdom. You're going to be Queen Dorothy. So what's the glory? Go over to... Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4. Look at, look at verse 7 and 8. 7 and 8. Henceforth there is late... Oh, verse 7. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. That's the qualification. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown. Who wears a crown? Royalty. Royalty. Yeah, king. Of righteousness. 
which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. But is it only for Paul? And not to me only, but unto what? All them also which love his appearing. And Paul defined the appearing in 2 Timothy 1 as the glorious gospel of the blessed God committed to my trust. Those of us who love Paul's message, we're going to have a crown and rule over those people. By the way, look at verse 18. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work. Interesting. We're going to learn that there's evil workers out there. And will preserve me into unto his what type of kingdom? Amen. Heavenly kingdom. Now, can I ask you guys this? Is Paul saying, you know what? Yep, I'm going to go to heaven if and when I die. No, he already knew that. That's not what he's talking about. When he says it's heavenly kingdom, uh, I want to get it below. Well, hold that thought there. Go over to first Tim, go to first Thessalonians. Go to first Thessalonians. Watch this. Verse number 12, 1 Thessalonians 2 12. That you, that ye would walk worthy of who? God. Why? Who hath called you into his kingdom and what? What? What does that mean? God is looking for some joint heirs with Christ to rule with his same glory, to bear his glory in heavenly places. That's what the body of Christ. I remember Don was asking me first. We said, how do we explain? The mystery to people. You tell them that a new agency is being used by God, being formed by God to rule and reign and have the heavenly places. The Lord Jesus Christ owns that. It's his. And he says, if you serve me now, I will share that inheritance with you. I earned it and I will share it with you. The only thing I ask is you're faithful to me. You receive the word in verse You've got to receive the word. Yeah. yeah. Look at Hebrews chapter number 12, verse 1 and 2. Now, let me preface this. We rightly divide. Hebrews is not written to the body of Christ for today. But there are interdispensational principles, which means the same principle that applies in prophecy applies in the mystery. And this is one of them. Verse number 12, chapter 12, verse 1. Wherefore, seeing we, again, the writer of Hebrews, the author is talking to Hebrews, also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, speaking of those faithful saints in chapter 11, Hall of Faith. Let us lay aside every weight, okay? Choose to do this. And the sin which doth so easily beset us. By the way, is that true too? Can we look in Paul's epistles and see a number of faithful men who served the Lord with Paul? Yes. yes. Timothy, Titus, uh, Epaphroditus, he almost died working for Paul. Many. So can they. By the way, look at chapter 12, verse 1. Let us lay aside every weight. Are there things that weigh us down in our spiritual life today? Yes. Sure. You can get uh, uh, entangled in affairs of this life. He says, let that stuff go, man. By the way, and the sin which does so easily beset us. Is that true for the body of Christ too? Yeah. Sin is right there at the door waiting to get us all. And let us run, that run that race with what? Patience, the race that is set before us. Does Paul say... Run a race? Yeah, First Corinthians 9, run that you might obtain. Okay? So the principle is the same. Verse 2, looking unto Jesus. Paul says, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. So we're going to look at the Lord. What did he do? The author and finisher of our faith. Talking about the faith of Christ, same with us. Who for the joy, all right, watch this, Dorothy. Rejoice in the Lord, right? Everybody got that? What did he rejoice in his Lord, his Father for? Watch this. Who for the joy that was set before him. Oh my. Paul's going to say in Philippians 3, I press toward the... He goes, forgetting those things which are behind and looking forward to those things which are before. What's out there? Look at this. The joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame... And is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. There's the glory. God says, son, if you do this for me, I'm going to put you in charge of everything. And you know what the Lord Jesus says? Father, I am willing to share that same heavenly places that you gave me, that I possess, with some people right now today in the body of Christ, in my body of Christ, of the suffering book. If they want to suffer with me in this truth, they're going to be glorified with me. That's that coronation. That's, that's the glory. That's the part of being part of the body in the head. Well, 
Not just being part of body, because every member of the body of Christ is a body part. Right. It's being a faithful member of the body of Christ yeah. in the mystery. Yeah. We always want to make that distinction. Mm -hmm. All right, let's go back to uh, go back to Ephesians chapter number six. Ephesians chapter number six. Mm -hmm. Oh, we saw this one. He says, "Finally, my verse ten. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might." Have, have, have in your mind that he's soon to come and allow the grace of God to be the thing that you strengthens you. That one day, guys, yes, we're suffering now, but he is he has chosen to give us that same inheritance. That he, say it like this, Dorothy. The same exact inheritance in the heavenly places that God the Father is going to give the Lord Jesus, we get. Everybody get that? You can't get any better than that. The Lord, the, the Father looks at the Lord Jesus and he looks at those in the body of Christ who were faithful in that same manner in our program and say, you're equal in my mind. You're equal. That's wow. fantastic. Awesome. That's fantastic. We're sons, equal. Rejoice, what does that verse? Rejoice in hope of the glory of God. He's going to share it. That's not being taught. By the way, if that's being taught at every church, Paul says, if I teach everywhere in every church, wouldn't you think that saints wouldn't get all entangled in the affairs of this life and they'll get busy with the work of the ministry? In the last day. Look at uh, Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Philippians 4, verse 8. Philippians 4, verse 8. Yeah. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are, what's the number one thing on that list? True. You have to give the truth. The number one thing God says to do is whatsoever things are true. I didn't stop right. But look, whatsoever things are honest. Truth is what what God puts puts out there. Let me show you something. You know what truth is? Truth is what God puts out there. It's the word of truth. You know what honesty is? It's, it's handling that truth right. Paul says, the hidden things of dishonesty. Okay? Uh, let me show you that. Go over to... What is truth? Truth is God's word. Honesty is how you handle God's word. Because can a preacher have God's truth and then misinterpret, misapply, and yeah. deceitful. You know, that happens every day, all the time. Yeah. Go over to 2 Corinthians. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. Everybody get that? He says, what sort of things are true and honest? You got, you got God's truth through Paul, and he says you must handle this thing the right way, rightly dividing the word of truth. Look at... Um, Yeah, 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. four. Yeah, yeah, that's the one. Verse number 1. All right. So the ministry is the ministry of the word of truth. Verse 1. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry as we have received mercy, we faint not. Don't give up. Understand there's glory coming in the suffering. But have renounced the hidden things of what? Dishonesty. Dishonesty. And how does he describe that? Not walking in craftiness nor handling the word of God how? Deceitfully. Ah. Oh my. Yeah. What sort of things are true? There's the word. What sort of things are honest? How you handle the word. Paul says they walk in cunning craftiness. Some of the stuff these preachers say when, I, when you hold their feet to the fire, just a bunch of crafty words and handling the word of God how? They're deceiving you. But here's what Paul says to do. But by manifestation of the you know how you walk honestly? Just take the word of God's truth and just give it to people. Stop playing around with it. Stop trying to be fancy with it. It's right there. Commending ourselves to every man's conscience in whose sight? In the sight of God. Go back to Philippians chapter 4. Finally, my, finally, my brethren. By the way, this stuff is in the word right there. I read it every day. I look at it. I say, yep, it's right where I see it. So I'm not crazy. I show you guys. So in Q and A, you say, "Well, Ron, I didn't see that. Let's show you again. I'll show you again. Look at this. Philippians four, verse eight. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, there's the truth of God's word. Honest, handling it, 
not deceitful, and, and so forth. Whatsoever things are just. Right. Not just handling God's word, but how you deal with others. See? Being righteous with, with people. Whatsoever things are pure, that's the purity of mind, that, that Paul says, to the pure, all things are pure. You know what that is, Dorothy? That's your heart. You, sometimes you say, how can people do stuff like that? I go, because the, their heart is not pure. You don't even, you know, pure, you don't even think the way those guys think. I don't want to think like that. No, you don't. <laughs> but I, I just crack up because I'll be telling you how, what type of stuff people are. You go, why would they do that? Well, they, you don't think that way. You've got a pure heart. Whatsoever things are lovely, things that, that, that generate love and so forth. Whatsoever things are good report. Um, so the, the, the good report has to do with things that are praiseworthy. Right. There, there, well, there it is right there. If there be any virtue, mm -hmm. if there be any praise, well, there it is, praise. Yeah, praise. Think on these things. That's your, your mindset. Verse 9. Those things which you have both what? Learn. Okay, you got to learn it. And then when you learn it, you got to what? Receive it and heard and seen in me do. Now, they actually saw Paul operate. When you do the things the way Paul do it, watch this. And the God of peace shall what? Be with you. His, 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 his life will be what, what operates. Now, we're coming down to end. Go to um, 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 1 in our, in our finalist. Finally, this is the final one. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 1. Finally again. Finally again. This is the last one in Paul. Now, finally, brethren, what? Pray for us. Remember our importance of prayer, the, the spiritual power in it. It, 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 it does attack the, po the policy of evil. It does. It has. Remember what we saw in, when we were in uh, Philippians about the praying on. Uh, and I said that one guy in that occult, he said he hated, they hated when, when, when believers would pray because it, it, it just messed up. It was like interference in there, what, they, what, what the policy of evil wants to do, spiritual wickedness. Paul says, oh yeah, it was weird in Ephesians. He says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. Satan hates the prayers of saints and his angels. It just messed up that whole, it's, it's a spiritual dynamic that I can't explain, but it bothers them, messed them up. Uh, that's why we sing. They don't. They hate it. It's, it's, it's like nails on a chalkboard. Two things: the holy angels love when we sing praise. Obviously, when we study together, come together, they, they, we're going to see that on Sunday. They want. They hear right now with us. They love it. But the fallen angels and Satan, Satan and his angels, they hate when we sing praise to God. They hate when we study the rightly divided word. They hate this stuff right now. Hate it. Can't stand it. Good job. That's my goal. I'm just going to give it to you. And my point is, they hate when we pray to Almighty God. Because we, they're in a spirit realm. Just like when, when the saints over there in Israel prayed and then they offered their incense and it flowed up to God. That stuff in the spirit realm, that thing, they can see those things. Those, the words are speak their spirit and life. They can see that stuff. This is real. They hate that. But the holy angels do. You guys enjoy it? Yeah, you do. All right. Paul said it. I know. Based on the word. Look what he says here. Look what Paul said. Finally, verse chapter three, verse one. Finally, brethren, pray for us. Now, what? Now, what? What? what what's the prayer? The word. But, 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 see, what? Here's the power of that prayer. Watch this, Dorothy. Okay. Why you pray? Here's the purpose. That the word of the y'all gonna get me started up this time. Right, word. Right, just get it. That the word. You know what Paul is saying? I want people to know about this judgment seat of Christ. I want them to know why we do what we do. It's all about that judgment seat of Christ. Wait, every day we go down through Philippians, the Lord tears, you're going to see it over and over again. That the word of the who? The Lord. That the word of the Lord, the righteous judge, may have what? Free course. Of course. How, how can something that is spiritual, get this, how can something spiritual like words be hindered. Because there, there's spiritual wickedness that battles against it and then pr prayer, prayer de it destroys that power. He's praying that you may stand perfect and complete all the will of God. How is the brother over there praying for saints way on the other side of the, 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 the Roman Empire? 
because there's some spiritual power in prayer that's affecting the satanic policy of evil. That's why. And that look, look, look. First number th- one. Finally, my brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be what? Glorified. Magnified, glorified. Even as it is with you, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable. <laughs> That's so funny. I, I run into this all the time. Unre- you can't even reason with them. <laughs> and they're wicked. <laughs> you know what wickedness is? It's going against godliness. For all men have not what? That's the problem. They won't believe God's word. They don't believe God's word. They choose not to. But, but without faith, it is impossible to please God. The problem with it is unbelief. By the way, Unbelief and pride go together. Pride and unbelief. Yes, faith. And then humility and faith. Yes. You want to be in that camp. You want to be humble and have faith. You don't want to be prideful and be unbelief. That's where most of the body and most of the world is right there. You want to be down here. All right, we got to end. If you're listening today and you never had anyone love you enough to ask you if you were to die today, you know for sure, keyword for sure, we're going to spend eternity. I love you, that's why I'm here. These saints love you, that's why we have ministry. That's why we put it out there, but more importantly, God loves you. And Paul, our apostle, says that the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who suffered for our sake, for Christ's sake, for his, for the Father's sake, died on that cross. The paper says his shed blood is what gives us a position to be before the Father, a justified pr- position. If you do that by faith alone, no works. We're not going to focus on the practice yet. God will save you this moment forever. Now, what do you do after you're saved forever? Well, you walk in the good works, Ephesians 2.10. That's your practice. What help you with that? That is a process of sanctification. It takes time, but if you put your mind to it, you can do it. That's what the faith of Christ, you trust in his faith. We'll help you with that as well. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the word of truth. We thank you, Father, that your words are alive and quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, Father. And even, you said, even though you said that in Hebrews, in Hebrew, it's the same truth, parallel truth for today. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, when you receive this, for this cause also thank we God without ceasing, for when you received the word of God which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, and it does something, which, which also worketh affectionately in you that believe. Thank you for your word, Heavenly Father. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for the Spirit of Christ, the word of Christ, and the mind of Christ given to the Apostle Paul. Laid out in his epistles, Father. My prayer, Father, is twofold. That we as an assembly continue to grow together in these things and desire. But I do pray for my brothers and sisters in Christ. Particularly those who are in the pulpits. That they would be... Uh, that they would have a renewed uh, heart of, of, of faith and humility. To, to, to receive these things themselves and to share with others. We don't have much time. The more it's rejected, is the more glory uh, that is being uh, stolen away from our Lord Jesus. But when we preach this truth, when that word of God is glorified, as Paul said, then you receive glory. So thank you, Heavenly Father, for the opportunity to believe these things, to know them and believe them, and to share, share them with others. Uh, may you continue to do this a thousandfold until you continue to until you come, Father, to, to the Lord come. We thank you for the opportunity to be, be here together. We ask that you bless our Q&A as well. We thank you in Christ's name. Amen.